people were sort of afraid, I think is what it came down to, to say, hey, I made a mistake. And so we had to create a culture um, that was more inclusive and one that people knew that there was trust and um, be very clear about each person's role and, and their priorities, and then they had to be accountable to them. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, how are you? I am good. Welcome to Owning Your Legacy podcast. And I really I am so honored you're here in person. I really appreciate the effort to be here because it's so much more enjoyable to have a conversation together than over screens. I'm kind of sick of the screen thing. So Sort of sick of the screen thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a pleasure so, to be here. So Jennifer, if you don't mind, will you introduce yourself for our listeners? Sure. Uh, my name is Jennifer Convery, and I'm the former group president of Griffith Foods North America. I currently sit on three different boards, and I'm an advisor to CEOs. I would love you to share with our listeners your story. Uh, it's a it's a great story, and I think there's a lot of a lot of experiences to share there. Absolutely, uh, I've always been in the food industry. Started with General Mills, then Johnson and Johnson, uh, and then Griffith Foods, and um, now on three boards. So I've literally gone from farm to fork. Nice. And um, have a lot of experience in that area. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about kind of, you know, even your childhood and like growing up and what got you interested in the food industry. Yeah. Um, well, I think the real reason, I, I've always loved food, mm -hmm. but um, I, during college, my dad uh, was pretty clear, my mom, dad, that coming out of college, you need to um, have a job. Mm -hmm. And um, Good advice. had me take tests to figure out what would be best and sales sort of popped right out um, to be sales or coach. And at that time on campus, uh, a lot of companies came on and I interviewed and the General Mills, it just clicked. And it was really uh, just an amazing experience. Uh, at a very young age, they are challenging you. I mean, my first account was $10 million out of college and I was like, holy mackerel. That's a you lot. Know? It is a lot. And they keep um, just the training and the management was was fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, uh, really met Kevin at General Mills. We've been mm -hmm. married 35 years. We nice. have three sons. Um, love that. And a daughter-in-law now. So nice. it's a um, growing family. And what did he do at General Mills? He was, we had the same job, similar job. Yes. Sales so, as well. Yeah. He was in sales also. He's sales, marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we uh, knew we wanted children. Mm -hmm. And so I actually followed Kevin's career to start. And that uh, forced me to, I'd probably still be at General Mills is my guess. I'm a very loyal person. Mm -hmm. and said it, uh, I went to McNeil Specialty Products, which is Splenda, okay. uh, and worked on that product uh, in New Jersey. And then we moved out to Chicago. And J&J &J offered me a job here too. And I thought, you know what? Kevin was working for Johnson & Johnson at that time. We'll try something new. <laughs> and was fortunate enough um, to interview with, it used to be called Griffith Laboratories. It's now Griffith Foods and um, started as an account director. Mm -hmm. I stepped back because um, I just had a baby and I thought, you know, I don't need to be managing other people. I need to sort of figure um, how to manage all this now. I think that's an important touch on of that it's okay to, to have the ebbs and flows in our careers based on what our family needs and, you know, and that, did you work through all of your children, like all of, you never had a, a time that you said besides maternity leave, so to, so to speak. No, I did. I, I worked through um, all the way through. I, I think I'm just built that way and um, it, it worked out well for me. But mm -hmm. I did take different roles depending what was going on in our family life. Right. So the first example of having two babies 14 months apart stayed as a sales you know, director um, even though they kept asking, you know, will you step up? Will you step up? And then when it was time, I did um, mm -hmm. and just kept going. But there's another example where um, our youngest son, Charlie, was just entering high school and there was a bigger promotion possibly at Griffith to take. And the timing just wasn't right. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I was already traveling probably 60% of the time. That's I didn't need to be doing 90 and so I think it's important to stay true to you mm -hmm. and to make sure you understand your priorities between your personal life and your professional life mm -hmm. because it is all one. 
right? It really is, and it really is. And I love that the way you describe Griffith, that even though you said not now, that it was not not ever. Absolutely. That, that the culture was like, that's okay, we, can, we, we hear you. And, mm-hmm. and how, how do you feel your kids feel about 60% travel? And, you know, do you have any... I love, your, I love some of your kids' stories, so we can talk about some of that. But, um, yeah, any mother guilt or, like, you know, any, any of... You know, I think we worked it out <clears throat> really well because I would... They knew I loved what I did. So it made me a happy person. It fulfilled me. Um, and I was good at it. And I was a good mom, too. You can have both. <laughs> I agree. Um, but you have to make sure you have a great network around you. And that, um, you know, Kevin's mom and dad had moved out to the area. They were incredibly helpful to us. Um, we, we, we had the right support to, to make that all work. But I would ask the children, tell me what's most important to you. Okay, in the next two weeks, is it the soccer game and this? Is it that? Like, you help me and I'll be there. We'll make sure it happens. And I worked really, really hard at that. It also helps when you have a great partner in life. So Kevin was um, just an amazing husband and probably more confident in me than I've been in myself and what I could achieve. And so um, I'm really grateful for that also. That's beautiful. Yeah, very lucky. (laughs) And yeah, and I think that you hear other stories sometimes, there are hard stories of that not being the case and even competition and you know, to have that true partnership is beautiful. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I also have heard the saying of um, instead of mother guilt, like it's mother want and the way you describe of, you know, tell me where you want me to be. And and you want to be there. This isn't an obligation. It's I want to cherish the time. Absolutely. That's a great way to say it. If I was able to pick the kids up from school, it was a they were so excited. I was so excited. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a we, we cherish the time together. And It was also back in the day when you didn't have um, the cell phone and the laptop and all the time, right? So I worked very hard at, I left my briefcase in the car and when I got home, it was family time. And once they went to bed, I can't say that I probably didn't pull things out and and do some work, I did. But they knew when I was there, I was there for them. And I wanted that time with them, right? Mm -hmm. That's so true, I think experiences with my kids now is definitely what I I cherish and as they get older as you know it gets harder and harder to find the time off work when they start working and but really we I think that's so true not taking it for for granted when we're working moms and I love what you were saying about I was happy I was good at it Mm -hmm. I think of my mom's era I don't know how it was with your mom but they didn't have a choice so Right. They were forced to be stay-at-home moms, or at least that's how my mom would describe it. And we're lucky. We're just really lucky because I'm like you. I uh, definitely meant meant to do this, and, and I think our kids seeing us happy is the best gift we can give them. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it today, women, we can work full-time now, and it's accepted. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't fully accepted when I was doing it. I was the only woman in the neighborhood, basically, that worked full-time. But I had some dear friends who were amazing and and stepped up and, and, and supported me in many ways. But women can work part-time and women can stay at home. We have a lot of choices, quite frankly. Right. Um, and I think that's really great. <clears throat> For men, I think that can be sort of tough still. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. a lot written about that, that men are now finding it hard to know what their role is. It's And as boy moms that we are, mm-hmm. we need men. We love men, we, you know, it's, and like you were saying of your husband, like we couldn't do it without this partnership. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how that all unfolds for this generation of men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was interesting um, when I was at Griffith Foods. Women, they're very good about asking for what we need because we've been forced to at times, right? Mm -hmm. If you have to get to daycare at time or if you have to do, you know, you you want to make the school play, you could go in and and explain why and, and, and how and off you went. I had a couple of men on on the executive team, and um, one of them, we were chatting, and she was like, well, you know, my wife really wants me to head up the Boy Scouts. I said, you should do that. I mean, that'd be a great experience for you. She's like, I can't do that. It's Wednesdays at 4. And I said, 
I'm your boss. Of course you can do that. Like, just let's yeah. make sure you have backup or whatever. But I think the best development for you right now will be outside of work and managing 14 little, you know, yeah. rascals. <laughs> good luck. Good luck <laughs> yeah. with that job. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, it's, it's providing opportunities for people, right, to yeah. be fulfilled at work and outside of work. And I think a lot of people's growth yeah. comes outside of work, Agreed. right, when your parents are struggling. Yeah. And what you learn from that, you know, when when you're teaching, I guess, or coaching Boy Scouts or teams or right. whatever it is, there's growth there that I think can help you um, be a better leader. I whether think that's very true. And I would love you to describe your journey to becoming president of Griffith, North mm-hmm. America. And even tie in, because I know you were an um, athlete. Squash, was it right? Yes, that- yes. I don't know how to play squash, (laughs) but that is so cool. But I have a feeling just as you were describing that, that, that being an athlete probably helped you in in your path to leadership. Absolutely. Um, I I think the great thing with that is you learn to win and you learn to lose. Right. And you learn that um, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of practice. And even if you do all that, someone's probably going to be more talented than you and that's okay and Mm -hmm. that's good and you should congratulate them right right wow how did you do that and learn from them um so i i love squash i played all high school and and college and a little bit outside of college um so any sports you know now i'm playing tennis teams and i just i i I really you're not doing pickleball everyone's doing pickleball well we do pickleball socially yeah Yeah. no no everybody's doing pickleball so that is a lot of fun it is it is fun it is fun you can go with a whole family and friends and everybody can play so it's a it's a great sport for that right to be very inclusive absolutely our family takes it to the competitive level but it's still fun yes oh, it's sick. well i can't say there's not a lot of talk going on yeah exactly. <laughs> and that losing part maybe you know i yeah. don't know <laughs> but i love that comment though of you learn how to lose i think it's critical in uh and especially in leadership just had a woman on recently and she loves the man in the arena that the uh Theodore Roosevelt mm-hmm. poem. Oh, I, I listened oh, to that one. That was, I, mm-hmm. like, every time I hear that poem, it gets me teary eyed. I'm like, it's so true of it's worth getting in the arena and losing better than the alternative. Right. Well, mm. it, it, it helps us all grow. Yeah. And, you and know, how did you apply that at Griffith? Of, because we talk about this at Edlong sometimes, of we say, you know, enjoy, um, victory and learn from defeat Mm -hmm. kind of like how do we autopsy and take the learnings from it so how did you guys do that at Griffith do you have any tricks or tips on that um you have to celebrate when when we would try to do something and think okay this is really going to work this is going to be great and and you trip along the way um it's okay let's just get up and figure out what happened why what do we need to do differently i always found um, especially when i was leading you know the sales organization or just even when i was president so much comes down to communication like i think about when we would do town halls and when you're doing town halls with plant employees versus doing town halls right with um, the office personnel there's different interests Mm -hmm. because their roles are different and i think really making sure there's clarity of here's where we're headed as a company here's what we're doing and here's how you can help right and to listen to the individuals especially the people that are on the manufacturing floor and elsewhere to really listen to say okay what is happening here how can we improve what can we do differently they know better than we know they're the expert they're doing this day in day out and can help so I, I think one of the key things is to learn to listen mm-hmm. and to also, it's okay to fall down sometimes. Mm-hmm. Let's get up and figure it out and we'll be stronger. And I like how you talk about having like a clear line of sight for everybody. It's hard. It's easier said than done. I, I get that pushback a lot at Edlong of, you know, mm-hmm. they, they know the strategy, but I think it's really hard to make it personal and individual right. to each person. Yeah. Do you have any um, like facilitators or help it, help in that or? Yes, I, I I've used a lot of 
outside help at times. Mm -hmm. um, I used a company called Excellent Cultures that really came in and helped us to be a much more accountable organization. Um, and that really came through authentic feedback to individuals. Um, and I, I, let's dig into that one. Sorry, now I'm all over the place. But I, I think that we were talking about this before we came on a little bit of living values within a company is one thing. And I think both Griffith and Ed Long, very family oriented, very values oriented organizations. But I said, I find accountability probably one of the biggest challenges. And I was reading about how you had really worked on that when you became president. So I'd love right. you to kind of talk about, first of all, like what, you know, what kind of made you realize that and then what you did and how you, um, what results you got. Yeah. Um, I think the feeling that I had at the time, there was a lot of finger pointing Ooh. versus opening your hand and saying, how can I help um, to begin with? And when you would ask the question, can you help me understand, you know, what happened here? Not why, but can you just help me understand? People were sort of afraid, I think is what it came down to, to say, hey, I made a mistake. And so we had to create a culture um, that was more inclusive and one that people knew that there was trust and um, be very clear about each person's role and, and their priorities and then they had to be accountable to them. Mm -hmm. And by doing more frequent feedback, we called it a gift. The, the feedback's a gift, and that can be positive. It can also be, you know, maybe this is an area we need more help, or what, what else could we do to make this successful? That that really, um, it was powerful. It, it turned the organization around, to be quite frank. That's um, huge. At the time, and people were not afraid to speak up and mm -hmm. say how things were really really were and at some points you know mm -hmm. you have to realize you you think everybody understands the vision you, the vision the mission the purpose right and you have to help in okay well what does this mean to me right. and so we did a lot of these breakout sessions for people and to, this excellent cultures out, this outsourced team that you used helped you with those sessions? No, that was different, actually. That was, different. That was okay. later when, when <laughs> Griffith, we changed our name and, you know, our, our purpose of We Blend Care and Creativity to Nourish the World. And people were like, wow, that is a really bold statement. How do I even relate to that? Mm -hmm. And so we would talk about, okay, we care. Well, let's talk about our health care programs that we have. We care about you and your family. These are all the things that we do. Like so, trying to bring things alive mm -hmm. um, for individuals and, and utilizing real examples, and then having people do that. Mm -hmm. Another good example, I think, is our values. Um, and employees could um, highlight other employees for living those values. Mm -hmm. And I, that program was just great. And that was yes. something we came up with internally. I think a lot of companies do it. Right. Um, yes, we try to do yeah. that too. But it's. When they get recognized in front of town halls and others, it, it really, um, th there's a sense of pride there. Yeah, you're right. You can never over-recognize or over-communicate. I think you're exactly right. You think you said something, but what do they say? You have to say it seven times. You have to just... And keep it simple. And keep it simple. It's, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to hear a little more about, though, your your path, because I, um, I heard you talk about this before, of... of when you started taking on more and getting and getting recognized as that you were more than just a leader of sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. When, when I was, you know, head of sales and, and um, at the time, we actually were having a lot of operational issues. And I realized if we don't get these solved, I, you know, I, I need to move on, right? Because I'm selling and we're not going to be able to make all this. Um, and so I went at the time to, um, he, he, I worked for the president of, uh, of Griffith US, and I said, you know, I'd really like to help with the capital planning for operations. And they were like, what is up with you? <laughs> like, you know, I said, no, I, I really think I can help with this. I, I'm not gonna tell them what machines to get, but can help with, okay, you know, what's the future of our business? But more importantly, I knew how to sell. And I said, let me work with them and we'll come and we, so we developed this team and it was head of finance and myself and the head of operations individuals. We put this whole plan together. We went at the time, it was Dean Griffith, 
um, and the CFO, and, and we did this presentation, mm -hmm. and I had pictures, because people hadn't been in plants enough, right, and just really brought it alive, and said, if we do this, this, and this, here's what we can promise revenue-wise to, and to the bottom line, and that really changed the owner's opinion of me, too. He was like, Jennifer, I can't believe this. I've kept you head of sales for so long because you're darn good at it, and we love you there, but I'm missing out. I need you to do more for us. And okay. that's where that's sort of we started talking about general management position and getting mm -hmm. the right um, training to, to be able to step up and do that. that and that's is how so, that happened. That is really cool, and that he was open and honest enough to say I made a mistake. Like that's, yes. that was beautiful. So yeah, when he called me to his office, I got to tell you, I was a little nervous because we asked for a lot of money at the time. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be like, I'm in trouble. Oh no, yeah. you know, and instead it was, it was a great day. Yeah. yeah. And you think about that of, you know, all the employees that you've had, like, I know I feel that way. When someone steps up and says, I want to take something, you're like, yes. Right. And I think you were referring to this when I was listening to you. Um, and when I was researching about the accountability and you, and you said, give them a project, give them and let them run mm -hmm. and take ownership of right. it. And I think that was brilliant because the ownership a aspect of accountability, if it's not, you know, in their heart that they really own it. Right. Then how right. do you get accountability? Well, and this was a great example because I knew, I mean, I was putting myself out there, right? And this could have yeah. been a big flop. Yeah. Um, it could have been. I didn't know, you know, do you buy this machine versus that machine and what it, um, it really what didn't have growth. to do with that it had to do with pulling people together really talking through what are what are the needs what would we need to do how should we present this having finance by the side to be able to say yeah this is the right thing to do and here's why um, right and you came from I would imagine the, cus the customer's perspective of we have to do this to keep customers happy in order to grow this is imperative exactly mm -hmm. and I think you know that was always um, a very positive experience for me. I've always stayed close to the customers and to our supply base. Yeah. Because if you don't have the right customers and the right suppliers, it makes it really difficult to be successful, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't have those relationships, look, something's always gonna happen. So build those relationships while it's positive because something's gonna happen that's right. probably not perfect, right? right? That you can pick up the phone to the CEO or the other president and say, okay, mm -hmm. we've made a mistake. Here's our situation. Here's how we're going to solve it. Does that meet your needs? You know, do you have other ideas, et cetera? But that really, I think it keeps leaders grounded in making sure they know where are their products going and who's using them and having relationships. Um, Funny enough, I, in part of my history at Ed Long, I was in customer service, which is really one of my favorite jobs of mm. the many hats I've worn. And um, that you can make those problems positives. If right. they do it right, you, you know, build really, credibility. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think being customer centric is it's the only way to be because that's right. That's yep. where all the where all the answers lie. So Jennifer, I'd love to hear your advice to others out there that are listening that ever felt underestimated and that they had more to offer. What would you What would you tell them to do? Well, I think it's really important. You know your value, and to be able to communicate that well. So. If you're a salesperson, let's just take as an example, um, to be able to say, well, I run the largest territory in the company, it's $30 million, and it brings in you know, $5 million to the bottom line. I mean, I think it's just really important to be able to share your value and then understand, okay, off of that, what is it that you're looking for? What role, What what is it that you have, that you can bring to the next role that can really, really help, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so have confidence in yourself, be bold and ask for experiences that will, um, help you grow as an individual. Mm -hmm. So a good example there is the operations. I didn't know about operations, but I learned a ton, yeah. which helped me that when, then I became general manager because right. I understood operations a lot better. So I think it's, um, really just thinking th being honest with yourself at what your strengths are and then leveraging those. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to do that? Yes, actually. At the time, I was being pursued by a big consumer packaged goods company to head up all of their sales. And so at that point, that was either I was going to stay in sales and just take over a much larger sales force, right? Have much more to revenue grow to, to grow, et cetera. 
Um, but I really wanted the general manager type position. I wanted to be able to run the whole thing. Right. So I came back to Griffith and we had that conversation that, you know, look, I, we're only so big at Griffith right. that I understand if this isn't the right time, you know, to be able to promote me to something different. But if not, then please let me go happily. Right. Right. Like, let, 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 let's, let's, yeah, let's do this in a, in, in a really good way. Mm -hmm. And, um, Anyway, by the end of that day, no, I was staying at Griffith, and it would take a few months, but that everything was put in place, and yeah. um, and off we went. You know, and I think you probably even understand that. Of, I mean, I, I certainly do. Sometimes, it's like having multiple children. You don't even know that someone's not happy, and and they need to come to us. And right, I, we need that sometimes. That wake up call, and I mm -hmm. I get it. I mean, I think it's uh, it's brave, and you and you got to do it. Yeah. You know, this also makes me think, um, I, I was involved with a Women's Food Service Forum, and I think that was an incredible um, support for me as an individual. Uh, it, at first, when I was invited by a customer, they like, you have to go to this. You're going to really, really like it. And I went, it was like 300 women. I was like, oh my gosh, I've never been, I, I never did a sorority or anything like that. What ended up, um, I even ended up on their board but in the network of women and men that I developed through that was incredible. And the mentorships mm -hmm. that I received. And so I think that's really important when you're in an organization to make sure that you have other avenues for coaching or mentoring or learning. And at Women's Food Service Forum also, I headed up different um, programs for them which challenged me in different ways that I wouldn't have that experience at work that I could then bring back and say, no, I could do that for you because I've done this, right? Yeah. Um, it's like today I'm, I'm part of Extraordinary Women on Boards. And my concern when I retired a year ago was going to be, okay, I'm on, these, I'm on three boards now and I'm advising two CEOs at different companies. And I thought, how am I going to stay sharp? How am I going to, right? Like, yes. how am I going to... and. It's amazing. They have experts in all these different fields and you you partake in their conferences or their podcasts or whatever they are. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's been a great support. Um, and I just think it's important for people. Sometimes we just keep our heads down and right. we forget how important it is to build relationships outside of your organization. Yeah. Who teach you, you I, I loved how, I'd love you to talk a little bit about how you you saw that and how you planned for it and you really... You really designed your retirement beautifully. So talk oh, about thank you. Oh, the board positions. Yeah. yeah. So at the time, I was a uh, group president of North America, and I was for uh, uh, quite a long time. Our current CEO was going to be retiring. And so I was talking with Brian Griffith, who I know you know Brian yes. well. And um, he, he wanted me to consider, you know, possibly being um, CEO or on the slate for it. And at the time, that's when Charlie was just starting high school, and I thought, you know what, this isn't, this isn't the right timing for me. Maybe someday, but not, but not now. But I utilized that opportunity to say, you know, I would like to grow, though. And I think a really good experience for me would be to be on an outside board. And Brian and the organization were so supportive. They even supported me to going to the National Association of Corporate Directors to get the training. Um, use Brian as a reference. Mm -hmm. um, Dot Foods was the first board I was on. I've been on Dot now over seven years, but that experience was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was a win-win-win because it was a win for me because I was learning. It was a win for Griffith because I was bringing back best practices. I was bringing back struggles possibly that could come our way too. And I was helping Dot, yeah. right? And so and I loved it because you were advising and not doing. And I am a great executor. <laughs> I, like, I loved execute. I know you were saying the other day, like, you're really visionary in yeah. this. And, uh, you know, I'm okay there, but I am an executor, 100%. Yeah. So it was just a great experience for me because I learned with my own team, too, to delegate more, to let them have ownership of things, to say, you know, let go, Jen. You don't yeah. have to be monitoring everything. And yeah. um so it really benefited my overall leadership and really, I think, all the companies that were involved. Yeah. But that then gave me the preparation when, when we were planning for my retirement. And um, it, it was a three-year 
um, conversation of, okay, how are we going to do this and do this best? And, um, and because I wanted it to be a beautiful transition, right? Yeah. I wanted well, what to a leave gift. it. It's a great gift. Oh, oh, I, and I'm so proud of, of that. Um, and so there was no secret, you know, this is what I was turning 60. I'd been with Griffith 30 years and you know, it was just time. It was time for somebody else to shine there. Uh, it had been an awesome, awesome career. But what I asked for is in the last year, I said, I'd like to take on one more board. Um, I'll do it on my own time and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'll take vacation time and whatever. And they were fabulous. They said, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So by the time I retired, I was on two boards mm -hmm. and was already interviewing for my third. That's um, so yeah, it, it's been, um, it, it's interesting cause I couldn't go from, you know, fifth gear pedal to the metal, right? Like you just, yes. you're right. You're working hard. You're loving it. You're, yeah. and then all of a sudden it's, you know, do nothing. Like, and, and, and I have too much to give still, right? Yeah, right. I want to. It's, yeah. You have so much experience, so much wisdom and absolutely. And I feel like also it's our identity, our purpose. Mm -hmm to to give you know and right, i think that this, right. that's that's a beautiful yeah no it's beautiful been way. um and what's amazed me because i would say to my husband at the time like oh i don't know if you know there's going to be enough and he'd be like jen you have no idea what's going to come your way sweetheart you have yeah. no idea and i'd be like oh i don't know you know and then the next thing mm -hmm. you know he was right as usual <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. it's kind of cute because like you were saying how he could see more in you you know and then sometimes you could see in yourself and yes. it, it seems like even in retirement he's like you're gonna be fine there's and also it was just time for us to have more fun yeah. and have more time with the children you know they're in la um i mean charlie's now in dc but at the time we were there the first two years it, it's it's been such a beautiful gift I, I don't even know how to um to describe that well enough quite That's frankly great. and um yeah so yeah so i love that treat. so tell a little bit about now that you touched on your kids so about how you ended up up out there about going to california yeah well this would be a little reverse mentoring yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um at the time i was struggling i, I actually i had breast cancer um and i had uh, gone through the operation but was was still going through chemo and uh it was the very beginning of covid and so oh, our the so boys hard. drove home from california because you didn't take planes then right with right. a mask and the whole thing and um and they did it a couple of times and we were out so we had moved to an apartment downtown because uh, it was going to be really fun, right? We're going to sing music and restaurants and do all these great things. And it was COVID and I had breast cancer, so uh, I stunk. Uh, but anyway, oh, so, so there, oh, hey, you know, it, right. it is what it is. So um, when they came home, we were outside on our deck and um, they were like, Mom, it, it, it's time for you and Dad really to be in California. We don't want you going through this on your own anymore. We want to be around you and um, we need you and, and you need us basically. Oh, and it was beautiful. Um, really beautiful. At the time, of course, I'm like, oh my gosh, well, you know, how am I going to manage all this and do it? And um, well, for a good year or so, you didn't travel anyway, right? So right. I just been getting up early um, to do the work uh, time-wise. Mm -hmm. It was the best gift ever given. I, um, I'm so grateful to them and, uh, for their love. Aww, yeah. That yeah. Is yeah. They're, teary. they're pretty, um, they're incredible men mm -hmm. and my daughter-in-law. Yep. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, it worked for them to see you happy and, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I think it, it got me healthy And you know faster. what else? I, I think even I back into, you know, raising like uh, five. Yeah. Just. <laughs> Just a crazy few. lady yeah. <laughs> but yeah like that um you know just creating these these good men like that's just uh it's it's a lot of work but it's it's so worth the effort and and i think oh, not being beautiful. the helicopter mm -hmm. mom and you know because we just right. simply can't be right that makes them stronger absolutely mm -hmm. no absolutely i so this story goes way back um I was in the back of my mom's car. We stopped to see her her friend who um, her last child just went to, off to college, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she had taken, raised all three children and, and was really the stay-at-home mom and the whole right. thing. And, and she was crying to my mom 
basically, what am I going to do? Like, he's going to, he, he, he just asked me for a divorce. Like, what, what, what am I going to do? I haven't worked. I, all I've done is given and I haven't. And as a little girl sitting in the back, I think I was like 12 or 13, I thought, that is never going to happen to me. Okay. But someone might leave me. I, I hope not. Kev. Right. <laughs> you know, right. right. 35 years in. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but I, it just was one of those moments where I thought, you got to depend on yourself. And that goes back to the athlete too, right? Of just, you know, I trust my partner, Kevin. I, I love him. It's great. But I have to have my own thing. And I wanted the boys to see too that women are bright. We're smart. And we can do both. Mm-hmm. And a dad can help a lot too. Mom just doesn't have to pick you up. And, you know... It doesn't matter who made your lunch, you know. Right. I, yeah, I, I. So I love that story. I feel the same. I except I saw it in my mom. I always talk about what an influence she made on my life of I, being the youngest of seven. She was very drilled into me. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna be a professional. You're gonna, yeah, you're not gonna depend on a man, and and almost maybe too stoic to some some mm-hmm. degree. But I think those young lessons that we get taught oh. are. Influential for sure. They are. Influential. Did you have a lot of siblings in your family? Uh, two sisters. Two sisters. Yeah. Two yeah. awesome sisters. They're older. Yes. I'm the youngest. Uh, mm-hmm. The best mm-hmm. place to be. The baby. The mm-hmm. baby. The baby. Yeah. 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 And did they end up hearing those same messages in, at that time, or? I I, mean, I don't think ours so. Are all I mean, so I, yeah. I'm five years younger, basically. Um, so I was home. It was right before I was going off. Um, so I think I was 13 because I was going off to, to high school and and my mom had two friends that that happened to and I might I, my mom shared a lot with me and I'm sure she did with them too but just to literally see that experience right. you want to talk about something really um, just horrific like holy mackerel yeah you know you felt terrible too right um, right and how trapped yeah. Yeah, I would feel I hopeless. Would, yeah. yeah, I mean that's how she felt at the time was hopeless mm-hmm. and betrayed, probably. Yeah, yeah. So it, it definitely had a big effect, um, and I didn't put that all together until I don't know, just a bit ago, yeah. when I, someone was interviewing me for something and we got talking. I was like, oh, that maybe was, this that is was why a I'm so that like, was a you triggering know. moment. <laughs> do you do a lot to um, support young women? I, I think you used to talk at high schools and things like that didn't you or? yeah I've done um well I mean at Griffith started Griffith Women Leaders right which we never had and did that globally um which has been just a it was a a fantastic um organization that gave so many more women visibility mm-hmm. and leadership positions um that it was yeah it, you said a lot of the women in that program ended up becoming being promoted yeah. because sometimes you know all of a sudden you're leading something and, and people say, wow, she really speaks well in front of an audience or holy mackerel, she's really bright. Like, and it, so it just gave people opportunity. It really became the training for the company. For I was going to ask you, so what was, yeah, so it was training and there was, yeah, we did a lot of training, or... whether it was, you know, accounting 101 or PNL 101. And we, we did all sorts of different trainings and as many men as women would come. And I love that because I care about all oh, leaders, absolutely. you know, absolutely. But it definitely was an opportunity for us to um, acknowledge the women that we had in our organization and really give them a platform to learn more mm-hmm. and have more visibility to be able to step up into new roles. So and like, who did the classes? So would it just be internal well, Griffith people, or we had we had a mixture. Um, I would turn somewhat to my network, but uh-huh. we'd have like our CFO, and so I would say, well. If you're leading this one, then you go meet with Drew and you go through it all and make sure he understands this is, you know, the major points we need to get across and such. So they would build these executive relationships and they might, you know, be a sales manager or right. marketing accountant or who knows, right? Like, right. Um, so it was it was successful. And we're but not we that would, scary, right? Leaders, we're not that scary. We want that connection, you know. And yeah, and I but think it is scary, evidently. Yeah, yeah evidently. people say, "Oh, it's scary." I'm scared of me. Oh, right. I felt like such an insult. You're scared I, of me. Oh, I'm so sorry. What did I do? <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I feel like the people that have been with me for like you know the 30 years or whatever, like absolutely, I not scared of me at all. But the yeah, right. the new, the youngins, and the, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we have to make ourselves 
vulnerable and yeah. accessible, right? Yeah, so mm-hmm. true. And I loved when you were talking about um, when you did the training on the cultures and accountability and that you guys had like little sign languages. I don't think we touched on that, but mm-hmm. I th- touch on that just a, for a minute. That, yeah, and that was a... Um, um, so that was another. I, I was always trying to improve our culture, right? Yes. Because um, never if you ending. can do that, it's if you can ending. do that, uh, things uh, results. And come. you think it's good, and then you can have a slip. I mean, absolutely. It, it, the no, slips absolutely. Because it's all people, and, right? Right. And you yeah. have new people and new, you know, structures at times and things like that. Um, this other tool that we use is called Culture Index, and um, this I guess this is a shout out for Shannon Fenema. She's an amazing consultant, and would really help with understanding individuals quite simply so that for example we know I'm an activator I'm a leader I want to get things done executor executor, let's go and so when someone would come in to my office and they had a problem I would want to solve it Mm -hmm. and what they learned to do was just to put up their hand like a stop sign like Jen I just want to make you aware here are thoughts do you have any ideas but we want to handle this okay I love it and then They'd forget to follow up with me. So I'd see them in the hall and I'd do a little circle with my finger. That's follow up. Uh-huh. Or so for different people, we had these different little signs and it, it just it it really allowed us to play to everybody's strengths and to know how to interact in a way that would um, bring that person out in the best way. Mm-hmm. It's a really really fabulous program and I, and I like the one where you kind of put your finger to your lip of like, okay, let somebody else speak. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it can be Sometimes I need that someone to do that to me, but um, right. yeah, it's right. Or I'll do that because yeah, hearing all the voices around the table is very important. And it is, and and there's so many tools to help with that too, right? Mm-hmm. Like we used a tool called Six Hats. It's the Debono program. Have I've you heard, done that? I've heard of this. We have not I done this. I love this one. So it really gets everybody at the table um, to contribute. So you start with like a white hat, which tells you about what's all the information we know. Okay, and then you would have a yellow hat. Okay, well, what's all the positive that could come from this if we do this? And then you ask everybody to wear the black hat at the same time. What's all the negative? So even your rah rah people, like the people are like, everything's great. We'll have to come up with something of what could go wrong. Okay. Your negative people, when you're wearing the yellow hat, they had to come up with something that could be positive, right? So by the end, you we- you wear these different hats. There's a red hat emotionally. How do I feel about this? So oh, cool. that's a really good one to do when you're changing organizational design, right? Like right. how do you feel? Like you just all this is going to move over here. How do mm-hmm. you feel? And it gives people the permission to be able to really um, contribute. And mm-hmm. it sort of forces people to contribute, too. Because, you know, if you're introverted, you want more time. That's fine. Take time. Or we'd right. write some stuff on paper and put it in. So you didn't necessarily know who, who had said it. But that's mm-hmm. not really that accountable. So right. I didn't like that right as much. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Have the bravery to say it. It's, right. Absolutely. Because you can misinterpret if you yes. don't know. Yes. You can't Absolutely. Go back. And I know you love Miller Hyman. I do too. Miller Hyman um, is awesome. Isn't it? It yes. grounds me. Yes. I feel like it's one place you can look at an account and you know where everything is. And yeah. Yes. So we just started, started that again and we kind of brought it back to life. We used to use it back in well, the day. Well, I think it's really important when you're going to take somebody's time and you're going to go to a customer. What's the minimum we want to get out of this call? What's Mm -hmm. the maximum? Who are the different influencers in this call? Who's the economic buyer, right? Who's the technical user? Who's, and so really understanding that and making sure, okay, well, if this is a real R and D technical question, Missy, why don't you ask that and ask that of so-and-so. So So it really helps you prepare, but I think it just allows for a much more productive meeting Mm -hmm. and one where you've taken the time to really think through the questions you need to ask so that we can end up getting them the product that they need or that and they want. Yes, and ultimately bring value and hear that yes. implicit need that sometimes doesn't come out directly. It's like you have to dig for that and really yes. put yourself in the customer's shoes. And I think Miller Hyman really yep. helps with that. So Jennifer, I would love to know what the legacy is that you would like to leave behind. In every interaction I have, I want it to be positive, whether it's with people or businesses. I just want to have a positive influence in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I love you talking about the joy that you're getting from being on boards and the, and the impact that you're having, you said is even bigger than you feel like it was as a president of Griffith, which is huge. Absolutely. Because Mm -hmm. you, you now have 
the influence, not the doing, right, but the influence to really help companies with their culture, or with their, where they're headed, what they're doing. And there's so many synergies between the different companies. You could be bringing that forward. And I think mm-hmm. it just helps for people to think differently. Mm-hmm. Um, they know their business better and, and, and where to head. You're just helping guide. Uh, and it's really, um, I, I, I enjoy it so much. I can't even, I can't even tell you. It's yeah. just, it's so much fun to You're go to make work. all our <laughs> listeners want to retire and get on board. So what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're still pretty busy on a day to day basis. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Which we will be talking about at dinner. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, for joining me. You're very welcome. <laughs>